participant has joined. Okay, welcome to your week five chat. This is for BC 2030. I am instructor Howard. Today we will be discussing chapter 31 in the step-by-step textbook, and this is covering inpatient coding. So what I ask for today. Uh, presentation when I finish the lecture at the end I will cover this week's coding assessment breaking down five cases and explaining what you look for and how to find the correct code started so we're in chapter 31 of the step-by-step and it's focusing on selection of inpatient and principal diagnosis which is our first slide and it's going to be focusing on the sequencing and specific guidelines to inpatient versus outpatient coding or diagnosis coding. Now, if you are um, if you have issues with the uh, diagnosis coding in general, then you may need to review how to specifically code diagnosis coding. This is one branch of coding is that you do have to take your time, and make sure that you code to the highest level of specificity or the answers will not be correct. It tells us here that a, condition, a principal diagnosis is a condition established after study or test. So when you code your cases, you have to pay attention to whether or not the diagnosis is before or after the testing, and if you're in an inpatient or outpatient setting. So also, the principal diagnosis, she is chiefly responsible for the admission, why the patient has been admitted to the hospital, or the main reason that the test or the treatment for whatever the problem is, is being done. It's all non-out patient settings like a facility, patient hospital, a hospice, acute care, short-term, long-term psychiatric hospitals, home health agencies, rehab, and so on. So more information explaining the selection of inpatient principal procedure. It says here, code from the ICD-9, Volume 3. So you have two sections, well, three sections in your ICD-9 manual. The first two sections specifically deal with diagnosis coding for a condition or a problem. The third section, which is at the very back of the book, behind all of your uh, nines and E codes and V codes, is the volume three, which is only for inpatient procedures that the facility is charging for. They're not professional. The physician himself, if he is chiefly responsible for performing the procedure, will code it as an outpatient using the CPT manual. But the facility can charge for the procedure as well if they are the main um, provider for the surgery. So moving on, principal diagnosis is definitive treatment rather than diagnostic or exploratory. For instance, surgery or a treatment is not something that a person getting a diagnostic test. You will not code a diagnostic test from volume three. You will code a procedure. Necessary to take care of a complication. If two procedures meet the criteria, you will report one most closely related to the principal diagnosis. So the reason for the admission has to match the main procedure that was done. So come on, it says the procedure is, is significant if it is surgical in nature, case of procedural risk, carries an anesthetic risk, and requires specialized training. That definition of a significant procedure in an inpatient setting. So more with diagnosis and services, it's that, that diagnosis.
standards and procedures must correlate. Medical necessity must be established through documentation. If there's no correlation, there's no reimbursement, which means that the main diagnosis has to match all of the services that were rendered, or diagnosis must be present on the claim, maybe four or more, to indicate all of the treatments that was done to the patient were rendered. That is establishing medical necessity. So here's some excerpt regarding the official guidelines for diagnosis coding, which you will find this information in the front of your ICD-9 manual. The full list or full guideline package in the front of your ICD-9 manual that explains information like this, such as symptoms, signs, and ill-defined conditions. It tells us that inpatient coders do not code when definitive diagnosis has been established. So what happens is once the test has come back, for instance, cancer um, or uh, any other type of problems, for instance, hepatitis or diabetes, once that is an established diagnosis, the signs and symptoms, such as a cough or a fever, are no longer reportable. You would code the main diagnosis that was established after testing. So talking about two or more interrelated conditions, it tells us that if there are two or more interrelated conditions existing, then either condition could be coded as the principal diagnosis. Each of them can be sequenced first. So some things that you learn about sequencing diagnosis coding is that you will code first this problem and then any follow-up problems or related conditions will go after. However, if both of them are interrelated and the treatment has been done for both, or the treatments are similar, then either one could be coded or sequenced first. It says here, unless indicated otherwise by circumstances of the admission, therapy provided, or tabular list of the alphabetic index gives you different instructions to code differently. So circumstances of the admission meaning that if something else has been done, for instance, if they're doing some treatment specifically for diabetes, then that will be your main or first principal diagnosis that is listed. All the other diagnoses can be listed, but they may not be listed first if the treatments do not correlate exactly. For information, it tells us, for instance, mitral valve stenosis and coronary artery disease are two interrelated conditions. It can be a principal diagnosis, there can be sequenced first. Or the, the they're saying it is that MVS, which is mitral valve stenosis and the coronary artery disease, or you can do the coronary artery disease and then the mitral valve stenosis, either one or either direction would be fine. And then it says resource intensiveness affects the code. So depending upon what services were rendered while the patient is hospitalized, the resources that are used is what will affect your choice. So if they're giving more treatment related to the mitral valve stenosis, those, then that will be your first listed diagnosis. So here, mitral valve stenosis is presumed by ICD-9 to be of a rheumatic origin. So either can be sequenced first. Another example, it says diagnosis of viral gastroenteritis and dehydration if both are treated. So if both of them are being treated at the time of admission, then it doesn't matter which one is coded first only the, de the dehydration is aggressively treated with IV fluids and the, um, the gastroenteritis 
is treated with oral meds, then you will sequence the dehydration first. You have the either or diagnosis, which is we're talking about contrasting conditions. It says coders code as confirmed in the inpatient setting. So in the inpatient setting you have a little bit of a little variation that you can use when you're doing your coding. Elimination cannot be made, then either can be sequenced first. So if they're having a probable or something that is possible, then either one could be um, sequenced first because the provider will probably be treating the signs and symptoms of both conditions. Here's an example. Pneumonia or lung cancer can either be pneumonia or lung cancer or lung cancer or pneumonia. So one condition, even though it's contrasting to the other, could still be considered first if both of them are aggressively treated. So you have contrasting and comparative diagnosis. It's the symptom code sequence first the other diagnosis. Here's an example. The patient is admitted for chest pain due to gastric reflux or a peptic ulcer disease. You could sequence first the chest pain and then you can follow up by treating, by, I'm sorry, by coding the gastric reflux or you can code the peptic ulcer disease first. Here's the rule. You would code first the underlying condition causing the symptom. Symptom is the gastric reflux, which is basically the regurgitation of fluids and food in the stomach. But the peptic ulcer is causing the gastric reflux. But you code first the underlying condition that is causing this symptom. So you could code first the peptic ulcer disease, and then you would code second with a gastric reflux. It is necessary to code symptoms to explain the resources that are used. Um, if the original treatment plan is not carried out, and we're dealing with section 2-F of the guidelines, the principal diagnosis becomes the condition that after study was the reason for the admission as an inpatient. Treatment does not have to be carried out for a condition. For instance, if the patient is admitted due to the signs and symptoms for a problem, there was no treatment, just some prescriptions, then you would still code the uh, principal diagnosis for whatever the patient came to the hospital for. that, um, and here's an example, the patient was admitted for elective surgery, they developed pneumonia, and then the surgery is canceled. You will still call the reason for the surgery, even though it is not, um, not why the treatment was done, if the, if the provider did some di a different treatment. So here, code surgical or other procedure not carried out because of the contradiction, which is a V code, V64.1, and then you would also code the pneumonia or other diagnosis. It says for complications of surgery and other medical care. If admission is for treatment of a complication from the surgery or from a different surgery or medical care, then you would sequence the complication code as a principal diagnosis. The complication is classified to this 996 through 999 series, and the code lacks specificity to describe the complication. An additional code for the specific complication should be assigned. So what's saying here is that the problem is from um, another treatment or surgery that the patient had. You would code that as the principal diagnosis. And 
horse, you would still need to code um, the, the, for instance, if this is the 9,900 range, and I forget what that is. I think it's an injury. Verify that that is, those are the injury codes. Let me see, injury and poisoning. Okay, our injuries, or it says here, okay, the 900s are uh, complications. Cardiac complications, respiratory complications. Then you will code the complication, and you will also code um, the specific complication that the person is having. Um, like in the fours or in the fives related to the gastric system or the um, cardiovascular system. So here we have certain diagnosis. If the diagnosis is at the time of discharge states that it is probable, suspected, likely, questionable, or possible or rule out, then you continue to call the condition as, as if it already existed until proven otherwise. So that's only for inpatient facilities. Outpatient physicians must report a definitive diagnosis or they will report the sign and symptom that the patient is having, even though it's questionable. For instance, a person could have questionable gastric reflux disease, an outpatient setting, even though the test has not come back yet, throughout the um, whatever signs and symptoms are, regurgitation or something like that, then that's what you would code on an outpatient basis. Inpatient basis, you can continue to code the gastric reflux disease. More information related to signs and symptoms. Cough, fever, and <clears throat> probable pneumonia. Inpatient code. Patient, you would code the pneumonia, but you do not code the cough and the fever. Patient, you would code the cough and the fever, but you do not code the pneumonia. You would code the symptom in an outpatient setting if you have a confirmed diagnosis of it. It says code symptom in an outpatient setting if a definitive diagnosis is not documented. Only the symptom, but you will code the, pneum the pneumonia if the test has come back positive. Kind of confused myself. So here's uncertain diagnosis. Here it is where we have to um, remove the exception. 0428 can only be assigned for confirmed cases. Even though the person may have signs and symptoms of AIDS, you cannot code this unless you have a positive test documented in the chart. The same thing with the ovarian influenza. You only should only assign for confirmed cases, which is a positive test. Information from admission from observation unit. So it says, patient admitted to observation for a medical condition which worsens or does not improve. Admitted to the same hospital for the same condition. Medical diagnosis is medical condition which led to the admission. And the inpatient. So it says, from the observation unit. The patient admitted to observation to monitor the condition, and which is a complication following outpatient surgery. And subsequently admitted to an inpatient, then inpatient to the same facility. The full diagnosis is that condition established after study to be chiefly responsible for causing the person to be admitted to the inpatient hospital for care. So it's from outpatient surgery. It says patient receives surgery in the hospital, outpatient surgery department. They subsequently admitted for continuing inpatient care. 
here's a line for assigning the principal diagnosis for inpatient admission. I'm sorry, inpatient admission is used. So it says, if admission is due to a complication, assign the complication as a principal diagnosis. If there is no complication, and I'm, excuse me, I'm going to go back. The complications are the nine, which is related to the surgery. If there is no complication or medical condition is documented as the reason for admission, you will assign the reason for the outpatient surgery as the principal diagnosis. Sometimes the surgery is not related to the complication that happens afterward. The person could come in for um, a, a surgery or a diagnostic test done, and they develop um, a lung or pneumonia problem. And if it is um, if it is documented, that will be the reason for the admission. If it's not documented then the, uh, the reason for the surgery would be the reason for the admission or the principal diagnosis. And as for another condition unrelated to the surgery, you will assign the code for the unrelated condition as the principal diagnosis. So we're talking about reporting additional diagnosis. The definition of other diagnosis are additional conditions that affect the patient care requiring clinical evaluation or therapeutic treatment or diagnostic procedures or extended length of hospital stay or increased nursing care and or monitoring. So even though you have a principal diagnosis, there may be five or six additional diagnoses that may have to be reported due to other services and resources being used and rendered. Some more about reporting additional diagnosis states guidelines when neither alphabetic guidelines when neither alphabetic index nor tabular list provide direction. So when you're putting in the I C D nine manual, you have your parentheses, you have your brackets, you have additional um, symbols and um, in code instructions that will tell you to code additionally if you're getting one diagnosis. But you use, if that information is not listed, then you will flip to the front to look at your guidelines to determine when or how to code these particular diagnosis or additional diagnosis. It says diagnosis reported in discharge summary should be coded. Resolve conditions, status post procedures from previous admissions that not have bearing on current stay should not be coded. So if a person was admitted to the hospital two months ago and those conditions are no longer in existence and they are resolved, when the person comes back, you're not going to continue to code those problems. You're only going to code the problems related to this particular hospital stay and discharge. So here's the codes, the V10 through V19, if they impact current care or influences of treatment can be coded or a history of a surgery, or history of personal history of cancer and things like that. We're talking about abnormal findings. Abnormal findings of lab laboratory, x-ray, diagnostic, and diagnostic test not reported are not reported unless the provider indicates their clinical significance. If findings are outside normal, Range and provider has ordered other tests to evaluate the condition or treatment provider if abnormal findings should be reported, which means that you need to ask the doctor if he would like for you to code these other abnormal findings on your current claim that you are about to bill. Otherwise, you do not report them unless they have a bearing on the treatment for this admission or 
this date of service. Uncertain diagnosis. It says if diagnosis documented at the time of discharge is listed as probable, suspected, likely, questionable, possible, still to rule out, or similar uncertain wording, you continue to code the condition as if it currently existed. Basis that diagnostic workup Further workup and initial therapeutic approach will correspond to the established diagnosis. Here it talks about ICD 10, which they will replace ICD 9, and it should have been October 1st of 2013. Um, however, they will be, this particular uh, branch of coding will uh, push back an additional year. But for ICD-10, um, we would pretty much code everything the same way we're doing now, except we will be using all alphanumeric codes in the future. So it's here for objectives development. They want completeness, expandability, small axial, and standardized terminology for the ICD. And so that's something that you will be seeing in the future. And your um, current textbook is um, talking about, you know, your ICD-10 coding in this chapter and explains to you what to look for. So going through the chapter, you have specific exercises on the pages that help you work out um, the coding so that you can understand better how to code. It will give you an example, and then it will give you a let's try it lesson on your own. And then what you would do is you would check your answers in the back of the textbook <clears throat> to assure that you understand this on the coding accurately. And if you have um, any questions, you, always, you can always call or email me. So what I want to do is talk about breaking down the coding cases for week five. So here we're going to be using the information that we just learned in this chapter about the guidelines and what we should code. So number one, I highlighted or I underlined specific things to um, lead us in the right path. So it says here we are going to code or sequence ICD-9 codes to the following inpatient state. The patient is admitted patient with epigastric pain due to acute pancreatitis. So here we have a sign and symptom, which is epigastric pain, but the reason is acute pancreatitis. So in this condition, in this situation, we have a, a firm diagnosis as acute pancreatitis. We do not need to code for the epigastric pain. Irritable diagnosis. Okay, so number two. It says assign a sequence to code for the following inpatient stay. The patient was discharged with a diagnosis of probable myocardial infarction. So the patient has been discharged and we do not have a confirmed diagnosis of a heart attack. However, we still code this patient as if it existed. So moving on, before I go to the next case, I want to make sure that you understand specifically how to code your vault in your ICD-9 because I'm reviewing the test. I'm seeing some of you um, may be miscoding for diagnosis coding, possibly because you're not coding to the highest level of specificity. So this is, there is an example in the textbook that gives you this exact scenario to code, and it's to exactly 
how to code this. For instance, page 885, 3 1, says for acute myocardial infarction, infarction is the manifestation. Acute indicates the episode of care. <clears throat> Myocardial indicates the general site of the infarction. So, going down, it says locate the term infarct or infarction in the index. The index is volume two, which is the first section of your ICD-9 manual that is in alphabetical order. You go to this word, and under, under the term infarct or infarction, you will locate the subterm myocardium. So, of course, the condition or the problem is function. The manifestation or well, the manifestation, the area of the body is the myocardium. Now, it says note after myocardial, you find the type, which is acute. And are directed to code 41049, but you can never stop at the index. You must always refer to the tabular list. Of you will miss important notes, such as the fifth digit is required. Now turn to 410.9 in the tabular, which is volume one. Under 410.9. You see unspecified site. Present it with a notation that a fifth digit is required. So it tells you to go back up to the three digit category code 410 where fifth digits are listed. The fifth digit is zero for is for an unspecified episode of care. The fifth digit one is for the initial episode of care. And the fifth digit two is for the subsequent episode of care. So since myocardial infarction was diagnosed during this visit, that would be the initial episode of care. So the initial episode of care in this case is that this one visit was diagnosed because it's probable basically are treating this at first episode. It is not a confirmed diagnosis in the patient's history. So the textbook tells us that the correct code for number two, 410.91. Then it gives you a case to try on your own. So many of your um, assessment questions are worked out for you inside of the, the, the throughout the chapter, but it's important that you go through and complete your exercises so that you can be better equipped to take the test. So we have. Case number three, it says, admitted for removal of malignant neoplasm of the kidney and ureter. It's basically asking for the correct CPT code for the surgeon. CPT outpatient, so you're going to use your CPT manual. If we continue to read, it tells us what happened. Under general anesthesia, incision is made in the skin of the flank, which is the stomach, carried down to muscles, fat, and membrane overlying the kidney. The kidney, ureter, and bladder are immobilized. The ureter, major blood vessels, and a small portion of the bladder are severed and cut off. They are removed through the flank incision. What it's telling us is that the Kidney was removed, the ureter was removed, and a and the bladder. I'm sorry, a portion of the bladder is removed. So, with your terminology, the term that you can look up for this is nephrectomy, because nephro is the term for kidney. Also, you can go to the word removal and go down to kidney and index, and you can find it that way as well. So once you get better equipped with medical terminology, a lot of
this information um, will be easier to cope. But because he did, um, for instance, in this case, the provider didn't just do a nephrectomy, did a removal of the kidney and the urethra, so you would have to add that as well. So he did a nephro-ureterectomy, the total name of this procedure. So you can find that in the CTC index. You should be directed to the proper code. And I'm going to look this up under nephro nephrectomy and nephro nephro ureterectomy. Some tongue can get on twisted. I have a conference open just to show how easy it is to code this particular condition. I am on page five. And it's the nephrectomy. It has um, ulnar laparoscopic part, laparoscopic uh, recent, and it says with your readers. So with it, with this way, we see that the your readers moved as well. So you have um, various cold ranges at the bottom that you could. You have to check each one to make sure you are coding for this specific condition that was done. So, one nephrectomy, you can match it up and get it down to where it says with your readers and check each one of these codes and make sure that what you're coding matches. Okay, so the next one is a volume three. It's the exact same procedure. And the um, difference in this one is that some of the terminology in the volume three is a little bit different than what you have in uh, the CPT manual. Pretty much it means same, and I'm going to that as well because there's a section in the move my books out of the way. There's a section in the um, in the the, the table. Here it is on nine oh six. There's a table on page step by step. Um, I'm sorry, page 906 of the step by step that gives you terminology that can assist you in coding for surgical conditions. For instance, on page 907, we have resection. Resection is um, cutting out or off without replacement or the body part. So when you're dealing with volume three, coding for um, procedures and surgical procedures, what you do is review this table and compare this to what you're coding for. So in this case, a resection was done to the kidney when you're doing volume three coding. So in then your volume three ICD-9 manual, if you go to the word resection, you um, resection of the kidney, you find this code very easily. Now, when you get there, you have to pay attention to what was done. There was a total removal of the kidney. They have portions that say total, and they have portions that say partial. This is the total. So you want to make sure that you code it as a total. And when you do that, um, 
You also make sure that it is inclusive of the ureter, which is um, additional or different codes. That to do for that one. It will be a four-digit code. You so it's not a CPT. It is an ICD-9 code. Okay. So for number five, it's here that we're going to code the CPT for revision of the total knee replacement. Your main term here is revision, and you go down to the word knee replacement. You're going to see either partial or total. And that's all you need to look for in the um, index of the CPT book. The same when you're dealing with the ICD-9 manual. You can do the same word, revision, and placement, and then total. So sometimes you're going to see where it's going to be asking you for um, some information, or you're going to see some things, some terms, or term in both the ICD-9 and CPT manual, but the thing you need to do is read in between, you know, read in between the lines, read the graph here, and determine if it's relevant, and that's how you would match up your coding. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to call or email me, but that is um, the first week, and I wanted to make sure I covered everything, I believe I did, um, 908 and 909, step by step, you have some additional choices comparison, medical and surgical root operations. And so you can read this and be sure that you understand um, how to basically search for your codes using medical terminology. For instance, a destruction, a detachment, a reattachment, reposition, transfer, drainage. Um, sometimes when you, you know, know exactly what it is that's being done, it's easy for you to pinpoint exactly what it is you need to look for. Okay, so thank you for watching. Have a great week.